Hello, and welcome to another tutorial from The Online Engineer. I'm Russ Brown. Today's tutorial is all about analog audio patch bays, and they've come a long way from the days of solder terminals, Christmas trees, and lacing bundles, if you're old enough to remember that stuff. But even in today's world of digital audio, there's still a place for analog. And as long as there is, people will be installing analog patch bays. So if you find yourself putting one in, I hope you find this tutorial useful. Patch bays have been used to interconnect systems for decades. Audio, video, data, and now fiber optic patch bays can be found in almost every broadcast facility around the world. But of all the different types, the audio patch bay is by far the most versatile. Even with the advent of digital audio, many, if not most facilities, still have at least some analog audio equipment, and therefore need an analog audio patch bay. Now, let's look at the different types of audio patch bays available today. There are two basic varieties of audio patch bays. The standard quarter inch, called a long frame, and the more compact, 0.172 inch, Bantam. The long frame audio patch bay jacks allow from 24 to 28 positions across a 19 inch rack panel. The plugs used with these patch bays are a bit different than the one quarter inch plugs you normally see. For one thing, they're made of brass and have a smaller rounded tip. These are called type B quarter inch plugs. The bantam sized jacks can fit 48 positions across a rack panel. The bantam plugs are also called TT for tiny telephone. Because of their smaller size, the TTs have less area to make contact when a plug is inserted. This can lead to intermittent connections. No matter what size the jacks are, audio patch bays are usually arranged in two rows, one above the other, with the top jack being an output from a piece of gear and the bottom jack being an input. In analog, the jacks can be evenly spaced or grouped in twos for stereo patching. Patch bay normally. When the jacks above and below are interconnected inside the patch bay, this is called normaling, and there are several ways this can be done. In a pass-through configuration, each jack is connected only to the equipment it's going to. A patch cord is required to make any connections at all. This is an unusual setup and is not generally used. Normal patch bays internally connect the top and bottom jack in one of several ways. Fully normaled is where the patch bays have each jack connected to the one below it with no patch cord required. In this configuration, the outputs are internally connected to the inputs without any patch bay, so the system is considered normal. Fully normaled is the most common configuration used in audio patch bays. By using switches built into the jacks themselves, when a patch cord is inserted into either jack, it is disconnected from its mate. In this way, the signal normally routed through the two jacks is rerouted to the patch cord. Half normal. Again, the top and bottom jacks are connected, but when a patch cord is plugged into the top jack, the signal continues to flow to the bottom jack and is present on the patch cord too. This is useful for monitoring the signal at that point without breaking the normal connection. However, plugging a patch cord into the bottom jack will disconnect it from the top one, breaking the circuit. Wiring the patch bay. In the past, soldering directly to the jack was the only way to install a patch bay. But today, the most common way is with IDC, or insulation displacement connectors. These make it much easier to install patch bays. The IDCs are found on the back of the patch bay unit. The IDCs consist of a round post with a slit in it. 
and the wire is punched down into the cylinder and the slit separates the insulation making contact with the wire. To remove the wire, it is merely pulled out. Here's a group of posts with the wires already attached. And here's the punch tool. Here's how you attach the wires. There's the shield. And now the negative wire is placed above the post and the punch tool is used to insert it. It also cuts off the excess wire, as you can see. It's a simple process and goes quickly. The IDC panel on a patch bay usually comes with a tie bar or shelf that gives you a place to support the wiring, preventing the attached wires from being pulled down. But you can also get them with the IDC panel detached on a separate mountable panel with cables connecting the patch bay to the IDC panel. When ordering, the normals can be configured at the factory. Or you can have the normals brought out where you can configure them by wiring the IDCs. This is also called normals out. This provides for a great deal of flexibility, but it also takes longer to install these patch bays. Unless you have a unique situation, you should order your patch bays pre-wired at the factory for the normals you want. It's much easier. Some patch bay manufacturers now offer normaling switches on the back and even on the front of the patch bay, making it easier to make changes at a price. Patch bay grounding. Grounding is very important in audio and at the patch bay. Doing it correctly can mean the difference between a hum or no hum. On most installations, the shield on the cable from the equipment is connected to the sleeve connector on the patch bay. You can get patch bays that have all the sleeves bust together. This allows for a centralized ground. In this configuration, the top row jacks sleeves are bust together separately from the bottom row of jacks. But there are several variations on how to ground a patch bay, as you can see. In a commonly used wiring scheme, the equipment shield is brought to the patch bay and stops. The shield only carries over if a patch cord is used. If the jacks are bust together, then they can be grounded. But this introduces three points of ground, where the ground loops can occur. It's just not a good idea. A good practice when wiring patch bays is to lift the grounds at the equipment and ground the patch bay. This allows it to provide a shield ground for all the cables. And the system becomes a single point or star ground system. An easy way to prevent or stop ground loops is to lift the shields at the patch bay with the bust sleeves of the patch bay still grounded. Another method is to not ground at all. You can lift the shield ground at the patch bay and leave the patch bay ungrounded. But this is not a good wiring practice. Patch cords. Patch bays use a TRS or tip ring sleeve jack and plug. Where the tip is positive, the ring is negative, and the sleeve is ground. Although these plugs are similar to the ones you use for headphones and other audio gear, patch bay plugs and jacks are very different. Do not use your standard quarter inch tip ring sleeve plugs in audio patch bays plugs as the tips are larger and will not fit properly. Patch cords come in a variety of lengths to fit your needs from 12 inches to several feet. Here you can see the difference between a long frame quarter inch and the Patan 0.172 patch cord. 
patch bay labeling. Labels are very important for patch bays. You can't patch if you don't know where it's going to. Getting all the information in that small area provided for the label can seem impossible. And using shortened names for equipment can be confusing, especially if it's an emergency. The best course is to lay out your patch bay in a logical fashion and have a single line drawing nearby with the patches clearly marked near the patch bay. This can make it much easier to understand what will happen when a patch is pulled or inserted. Analog audio has yet to die, and as long as it's around, there'll be a need for analog audio patch bays. Well, I hope you found our tutorial on analog audio patch bays informative. I tried to cover many of the topics that have come up for me over the years when I've been installing these things. And if I haven't answered all your questions, please feel free to write in to info at theonlineengineer.org. And while we're talking about analog audio patch bays, a few years ago when I was installing some brand new ones, they were from a well-known manufacturer, but someone I've never used before. I ran into a lot of trouble. The tops of the posts to punch the wires into kept curling over. And although I worked with them and they sent me new patch bays and new tools, it just didn't work. Every so often, another post's top would just curl over. Uh, eventually, I wound up sending them all back and buying brand new ones from a different manufacturer that I had used before. So it was a very frustrating experience, but by working with the manufacturer, I was able to work it through by not using them and getting someone I've actually used before. Anyway, Till next time, this is Russ Brown.